1994, first-year teacher Aaron Gruel's 150 high school students had already been labeled as unteachable. Aaron chose an abrupt shift from the traditional curriculum and handed out copies of the Diary of Anne Frank. She encouraged her students to record their own experiences, fears, and dreams in personal essays. All 150 students would graduate four years later, and their writing was collected in The Freedom Writer's Diary, an international bestseller, and the basis for the feature film The Freedom Riders, starring Hilary Swank. My name is Erin Gruel. Today, Erin Gruel runs the Freedom Riders Foundation, which aims to help teachers engage, enlighten, and empower at-risk students to reach their full potential. In Dear Freedom Rider, Erin introduces a new generation of Freedom Riders, the book includes 50 letters from young people around the world on topics ranging from racism and poverty to mental health. For today's conversation, Erin Gruel is joined by Narada Comins, one of the original Freedom Riders, and Dr. Paula D. Knight, Superintendent of Schools for the Jennings School District. Dear Freedom Rider is available for purchase from St. Louis Independent Bookstore, Left Bank Books. Good afternoon. I am Paula Knight. I'm the superintendent here in the Jennings School District, and I am pleased to be a part of this author uh, event, book event, uh, with the world-renowned Erin Gruel. Um, as I said, being uh, an educator, um, I've followed your work for many years, um, and what I think is uh, incredibly interesting is that you initially started out um, thinking you were going to be a lawyer. And it was until you immersed yourself in the Los Angeles riots, uh, that's when you decided you wanted to become a teacher. Um, and then you started teaching at the Woodrow Wilson High School. And what I will say, um, this is about, you know, people talking about uh, what's impossible and you made it possible. Those who are unteachable, uh, you began to teach them in a way that they're only, we could only think about. Uh, we could only imagine. Uh, so again, welcome uh, and thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Erin, was there anything you'd like to say before we get started? First of all, I'd like to say thank you, Dr. Knight. As, uh, as a kindred spirit in the fight for equity in education, it's so humbling to be a part of your community. And so thank you and th hello to everyone in Missouri. Ah, well, thank you so much for that. Thank you for that plug. And we must have you back here uh, in the St. Louis area in the near future. Uh, so here we're, we're here today to talk about uh, Dear Freedom Writer. Um, and this is uh, coming on the heels of really uh, what our young people are dealing with um, in their everyday lives. Um, Dear Freedom Writer is a unique piece of work um, because it really um, gives our young people an outlet. Um, our young people are indeed hurting and they are going through so many um, ups and downs, so many ebbs and flows in their life, and they have an opportunity to tell their story, to become those teen storytellers, to talk about going through um, identity crisis, LGBTQIA crisis, uh, poverty, mental health, um, and quite honestly, uh, police brutality, um, and imposed borders. And so they had the opportunity to um, put their writing together um, and look at receiving a response from the original Freedom Writer. So I must say, this was, um, this is massive. This was a massive undertaking. Um, and I read the book several times, um, but what it forced me to do as an educator is to slow down and to, um, and to look inward and look at what I'm doing or what I can do better for the young people in the school district in which I serve. And so you talked about this being, uh, this was a massive undertaking and there is no doubt about it. But you mentioned early on, you talked about um, this is a literary dance. Can you talk about or speak more to the literary dance? Absolutely. I think as an English teacher, I, I always was hopeful that 
my students wouldn't have like a one and done that it's, it's a process and it's a craft. And I was, I was blessed to have so many original freedom artists who are athletes, who, who know about training and, 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 and working their, their muscle matter. And I wanted the, the art of writing to be just that. And because my original freedom writers learned from other young folks who had been in great pain, but use words and not weapons, whether it was yeah. Anne Frank in her attic, Ellie Wazell at Auschwitz, or, or even a young girl in, in Bosnia Herzegovina, who all of these young people wanted to make a difference through their words and, and not the destruction that they faced around them. So the irony of our book coming out now at a time when we can turn on our television and see what's happening in the Ukraine is, is, is very surreal. Yes. Because our backdrop was always paying homage to, to young people who, who lived in wars, either declared or undeclared. Yes. So the idea of it being a dance is I wanted these, these young people to have courageous conversations with a piece of paper, to have courageous conversations with those that were responding, and then courageous conversations with themselves. And to do so, you, you have to write draft after draft after draft. And they yeah. did just that. They, they made a commitment that this dance would be a journey and that we would come together. And there's a mantra we have in, in Freedom Writer world that, that family is what we make and, and family is what we choose. We choose. And in doing this process, it, we, we became just that, a family. And it was delicate and it was very tender. There was a lot of tears, uh, a lot of transparency, but also so much encouragement, so much empathy and so much love. Yeah, yeah. And you definitely feel, you know, you felt, I felt the love uh, reading, going from one letter to the next um, from the responses. It was just, it was incredibly uh, powerful. Um, but you reminded me of something, the power of the pen um, and the sense of healing, that there's healing in writing. Um, you taught your students, uh, writing creates change. Um, and on page 189 specifically, I'd like to read that, choosing the pen to heal your soul rather than silence that feeds your pain is what a true freedom writer is. And so, you know, that stuck with me as well, the power of the pen, paper as the shield, right? Um, so can we talk about um, just the, the lessons learned from Dear Freedom Writer, from the diary, um, because there was, as you said, there was a lot to unpack there. But, you know, part of this work is around what's the lesson learned? Can Absolutely. you talk about that? Absolutely. Well, I, I love our, our name, Freedom Writer, is is truly an homage of the civil rights advocates, writers, R-I-D-E-R, -E who following in the footsteps of a uh, former Congressman John Lewis, who, yes. who rode those buses, um, crossed that bridge in Selma and, and fought for equity and, and equality in our, in our classrooms. Yes. So as teenagers, when the original Freedom Writers learned about the Freedom Writers from the 60s, mm -hmm. we, we realized these are, really big shoes to fill because freedom writers are activists and they do something. They stand up, they speak up and ultimately speak out. So in writing their truth in the Freedom Writers Diary all those years ago also came this feeling of, of activism and whether they were accidental activists or accidentally on purpose, uh, the Freedom Writers spent the last two decades working with educators and, and working with kids to face fears, to tell truths and, and hopefully and ultimately share stories. And so this new book, Dear, Dear Freedom Writer, was a wellspring at a time when people were in, indoors and, and scared and, and tentative mm -hmm. about what was gonna happen next. The, the Freedom Writers wanted to show that you're not alone. And it gets better. And there's someone just like you who made it out the other side. And that's the beauty of this book is every curated letter had the ability to find a freedom writer who said, I've been there, mm -hmm. I've done that. And look at me now. I'm going to change the narrative. I'm, I'm not a victim. I'm a survivor. Mm -hmm. And I think that pedagogical shift of, of being a survivor was so empowering yeah. for not only the freedom writers, but for these young 
student authors to have a, a hand reaching out for them. And, and it was a hand up, not, not a hand out. You know, there, right. It was a, from a place of empathy, not sympathy, and a place to say, you can do it. You know, we are your cheerleaders, we're, we are your champions, and we're going to root you on. That's fantastic. So that, that's a great segue. Um, going from each letter, one letter to the next, and getting through all 50, um, I was struck by uh, letter 48, which is what is family? Family mm-hmm. is what you make. Family is what you choose. However, it was toward the end. And so I'm just curious, um, you know, we talk about the cadence of writing um, and the style of writing. So can you talk about how you went from the first letter to the last letter? What what was that cadence like? How did you determine that? That was was a lot of late late nights. Uh, We had this core of of freedom writers, um, many of whom had the opportunity to go back to school to work on this project. Freedom Writers had the opportunity to get either their master's degree to work on this project or to finish their bachelor's degree. So Freedom Writers and I were receiving these letters, brainstorming who was going to answer. And initially with the, with the Freedom Writers Diary, the, the literary arc for, for those English teachers was our, our four years in room 203, you know, from freshman year through their senior year. And then the subsequent editions were the 10th anniversary and the 20th anniversary. So it was linear and it was chronological. With this book, it it was a year in the life of of these students. And so there was 50 letters, 50 responses. And what we wanted to do was in placing them on this literary spine was to allow the reader to, to be going to different communities. We have over 10 different countries that participated. So we wanted to spread out the international stories. Um, so there was a, a story about somebody dodging bombs in the Gaza yes, Strip and somebody yeah. dodging bullets in Tel Aviv, Israel. Yep. And so we wanted to have these, these moments where as a reader that you would come back to a, a story that was similar. So with my introduction, I, I wanted to lay the foundation that that family is what we make. Yeah. And the story you referenced, was about a young person who is a part of the foster care system. And as an administrator, you know that so many young people yes. don't have homes with a white picket fence, are, are not coming from a nuclear home. And we, we wanted to showcase that, that sometimes family's not biological. That's right. Sometimes schoolmates can be your brothers and sisters keepers. And so I, I think it was really important at the end to, to have another reference point that that not yeah. every kid lives in a utopia. And, and we want to showcase that and, and, and honor the truth that this young person was coming from. But the response was so beautiful about finding family, yeah. curating family. And I think that's what we wanted to do in this book is for the readers to go out and, and find family themselves. So, you know, as I'm listening to you and, you know, part of reading, you know, the style of reading is that you immerse yourself into what you're reading and becoming one with the students and and learning how to internalize uh, what they're feeling. And so you've been given an amazing gift at embracing young people, um, uh, developing that sense of trust. But I'm just curious, um, Aaron. when do you find time or do you find time to write personally? I, as, a, as an English teacher, I, my, my, my role has evolved, but I, first and foremost, I am, I am a nerdy teacher and I, I embrace the nerdy element of, of my life. Uh, on, on any given day, I have chalk on my butt still. And so I think what is so important for me is yeah. that, that I have to model what I'm asking of my students. Um, mm-hmm. And that's writing. So I mm-hmm. journal. Um, sadly, my, my father passed away years ago. And I started writing letters in a journal directly to him. Um, so that, mm. that it felt more real if I, if I could share the journey with him since he was a part of the journey from the very beginning. Mm. So I think for me, um, yeah. writing is an outlet. Writing is cathartic. Writing can purge any problem. And I, 
I think writing also helps a lot of students deal with their with their mental health. And I think during this pandemic, I'm so I'm so happy that we're learning to to take away the stigmas and the stereotypes that, that come with mental health. And so I, I really encouraged my students who were struggling with their mental health to use writing as an outlet in the same way that we would use talk therapy or, or medication. So they all kind of go hand in hand. So for me, writing has been uh, a salvation from the beginning and it will be a salvation for me till my dying day. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for that. And so, you know, we talk about now more than ever, um, mental wellness um, and a healthy sense of self um, are essential to our work and daily responsibility. So Erin, what can you offer educators who are watching us today? How do they find and maintain that healthy life balance? What I love about young people is they, they, they understand the term self-care. I, I had never heard self-care growing up or in college or even those, those, those mm -hmm. initially Agreed. as an educator. And I, and I love that young people understand that. I think young people are a little bit more evolved when it comes to some of these courageous conversations that we adults need to embrace. I did not have self-care when I first started teaching. And, and that was a hard part of our story being adapted from a book to a feature film because they wanted to put some of those elements of, of my personal life into the film that, that made me kind of uncomfortable. So I've had to learn about, about self-care and, and advocacy from my students, which is ironic because I went from being their teacher to becoming their student. Um, you know, I, I, I fly a lot and, and flew a lot pre-pandemic and it's starting to happen again. But the flight attendant always comes out and the flight attendant always talks about the oxygen mask and, and putting it on yourself first and then the child sitting beside mm, you. And I think mm. in the world of education, yeah. it's the adverse. Most teachers take the oxygen mask and they give it to the kid. They give it That's to right. the student and they forget to breathe. And I think I forgot to breathe. I, I forgot to get oxygen to my lungs. So I'm, I'm learning from those flight attendants and from my very students what does it mean to breathe? Yeah. What, is, what does it mean to take a moment, to take a beat? Yeah. And I think there's elements within this book of, they say out of the mouth of babes, so many of these young writers have these answers, even though they're seeking solutions, they are also problem solvers themselves. Mm -hmm. And so adults, as mm -hmm. we're reading this book, we're gonna learn so much about yeah. those that we humbly serve because they, they have the ability to be a student, but more often than not, they have the ability to teach one to teach another. To your best recollection, um, which of the letters was probably the most difficult? Ooh, you know, every single one of these 50 letters um, was a cry for help. And they were, they were radically different and, mm -hmm. and radically spread out through storytellers across the globe. Um, and so at different times, it's almost like children, um, freedom writers always want me to love them best. And so now these student authors, I'm sure, um, have that same sentiment. But for me, what I was the most excited about is learning about indigenous cultures. Um, mm -hmm. We had, we had sev several indigenous writers, uh, a, a beautiful young woman writing about residential schools from Canada, uh, someone who was a Maori in New Zealand, another young boy who is indigenous from New Zealand. And what all of them touched on was their rights for, for their culture, their creed, their language, and how colonialism was imposed upon them and they weren't able to practice their, their voice, their religion, their, their language, their, their, their tribes and their talent. So a lot of those stories taught me a lot. Uh, there was a story from a young girl in India who wrote about the caste system and, and how demoralizing that was for her, for her when yeah. she had fallen in love. There was a story about a young boy originally from Kurdistan who was now seeking asylum in Germany as, as a refugee mm -hmm. and what that was like to, to flee the, the destruction of ISIS on his mm -hmm. hometown. 
So there was this moment when they, when the young authors had gathered, this was just a few days ago. And we were, we were reenacting one of our signature events called the Lion Game. And when, when we were done with my questions, some of the student authors stepped forward and, and they asked questions. And the young indigenous girl from Canada asked if anyone in the room prior to the book had known about these residential schools in Canada. And a little girl named Hannah from Ohio, she stepped forward and she said, I didn't know before, but because of your story, you taught me. And we all just burst out in tears. And I thought, oh my God, these kids are teaching one another. These kids are now historians and these kids are, are paying it forward. And so those were the moments of this book that I, I reveled in is every time I learned something new or every time a question that I had was answered. And so I'm as excited as the reader, even though I was involved in, you know, behind the scenes, um, now that it's put together and there's this cadence and there's the symmetry, I, I'm more excited now because yeah. I feel like, you know, my brain is, is still learning and still evolving. So what I'd like to do um, is to read um, an excerpt from the poem at, at the end. Poetry is our poker face. The most precious poetry our mentor ever preached to us was write yourself into existence. Rewriting the narrative of society, our struggles and surroundings don't define us. The pen is our sword, paper our shield, Writing gave us the ability to fight freely. This is our words. This is our future. So when we talk about the future, Aaron, if we fast forward the proverbial circle of life, and let's just say it's the year 2072, it's 50 years from now, knowing what you now know, what advice will you leave to the future freedom writer? Wow, we just celebrated Anne Frank's 92nd birthday. And, and we'd gather, we did a, a virtual tour on, on Anne Frank's 92nd birthday. And I, I think there's a legacy with books and words yeah. that, that I'm hopeful that the original freedom writers who are now married and have children, this next generation of storytellers will eventually get married and have children that it is painted forward, um, right. unflinchingly honest and, and, and uncensored. I think that was our fear is, will, will this book be banned or will it be burned? And then part of the Freedom Writers thought, well, the best way to get a kid to read a book is to burn it and to ban it. So I, I hope that we can continue <laughs> writing right. stories from a place of an authentic narrative and, and living our authentic lives. You know, our, our book really was a magnet for people who were marginalized, yes. who were invisible and voiceless. And I just hope yes. that we can give voice to the voiceless. That's, that's, that's fantastic. Before we close um, and we move on to um, one of the original freedom writers, um, Narada, uh, who is with us uh, this afternoon. Do you have any parting thoughts or any parting words uh, for this segment um, of our conversation, Aaron. Is there anything you'd like to leave us with? I think the, the most humbling part of this process is the, the beauty of community and, and the communal storytelling. I think what, what I have loved and learned is that we're almost like this jazz ensemble and, and we're all just kind of riffing. And, and when we get it just right, it's, it's exquisite. Yes. And so I'm so honored that in this jazz ensemble is Narada. And so you, you, you mentioned grace earlier. And I yes. think there's been these moments of divinity in this process where we've seen the, the worst that has happened to humanity, but in, in this process, we've been able to elevate the best of humanity. And I think Narada has done just that. He is the best of humanity. Well, thank you for that. And thank you uh, for your time this afternoon. It is indeed appreciated. Uh, so now we will hear from Narada um, who will read uh, one of his pieces. Narada, thank you again for your time this afternoon. 
Um, oh, no problem. And you, you, you've heard Aaron um, gave uh, a perfect um, opening. Um, so of course, I'm, I'm really anxious and excited to hear some of your work. Um, and again, thank you for your time this afternoon. So the excerpt I'll read um, from Dear Freedom Writer, uh, my part, um, very small part, but um, kind of goes back to what we've been mentioning today. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to work on myself alongside my Freedom Writers family. And I urge you to shy away from family members whose instinct might be to dismiss your truth. As you continue your journey of healing, you may discover that your true family is not biological. As we say in Freedom Writers world, family is what you make. Perhaps you too can make a family with your classmates, friends, or even fellow survivors. So Narada, what, talk to us about your experience. Um, and the biggest piece um, as a teacher, I always wanna know about lessons learned. And so part of this is you know, the reflective piece. So can you just talk about some of your reflections and, and what you've learned from this? Uh, absolutely. Being a student in the whole freedom writer world since the beginning, since we're talking 1994, I think this whole experience has been eye opening and it's it's like it's the it's the version of a real life pop up book, just the humanity lessons uh, within it. I think we've all become more well rounded people by the experiences that we were able to to have just by uh, writing a story, writing a book, and having somebody like Aaron, uh, Ms. Gruel, to believe in us when everybody else kind of didn't. And they kind of just put us in this box and, and just thought, oh, well, we're just another bunch of kids. But she had other ideas, and she kind of unlocked our true potential. And here we are today. So reflect as well. And, and let's fast forward 50 years from now. What do you how do, what do you see if you had a crystal ball 50 years from now? What does this work look like and how do we ensure that it continues? Well, what I've learned and what I've seen and what I've noticed. Immortality, when you write something down, when there's books and there are movies, they go on and live longer than we do. And go. what a blessing. There was a movie, a documentary, a Dear Freedom Writer book that the next generation and the next generation after that will pick up and they'll see and the story continues. Uh, we've been blessed to hear people talk about how our story has inspired them and changed their lives. They've become educators. Students have stopped acting bad. We have might save somebody from committing. I know for a fact we've saved people from committing suicide. And it's just it's amazing to see the works of what they've done in our eyes. So I can only imagine 50 years from now, everything keeps going. Uh, I have a 16 year old son, I have a five year old daughter and they're all about everything, uh, Freedom Riders and the lessons I've learned here, I pass on to them. So hopefully they're, my great grandchildren are still talking about Freedom Riders and people need something that relates to them. People need to see them in the yeah. stories. And we saw ourselves in Anne Frank when we read Anne Frank. We saw ourselves in Zlata Filipovic's story. Young kids going through whatever the conflict is, but there was a commonality within the conflict that we would find and we would find it relatable. And it did nothing but um, it did nothing but encourage us. It did nothing but inspire us. So um, that's just my, my, my hope 50 years from now these stories keep going and keep it and and just keep making people better keep helping people keep inspiring i mean at the end of the day that's what the purpose of the book was for it's pretty amazing but yeah 50 years from now i pray that's still going this will keep going so i'll say we will end this with an ellipsis not a period meaning that this work will continue this, is, this has been a truly um, a powerful afternoon. Um, and again, I just, I thank you both. I, I just, I do, I thank you both. Thank, thank you. you. Well, Dr. Bright, you said uh, the magic word, the ellipsis instead of a period. And in Freedom Writer world, we have a hard time saying goodbye. So we always say dot, 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 see you later, because it's a little bit more hopeful and it leaves both 
your door and your heart open. So I think that's what I want to say to you and the fine folks in Missouri. This is more of a dot, dot, dot. See you later. And definitely not a goodbye. Thank you.